that are connected to the world that can use Facebook and Twitter and have access to information about the way the outside world works. And if you look at the Arab Spring and the initial drivers of it, it is exactly that kind of person that was out in the streets in Tunis, that was out in Tahrir Square, uh, that has been pushing uh, you know, for the downfall of these uh, Arab dictatorships. Now, once this thing gets going, lots and lots of people have grievances and objections, and so you get trade unionists and peasants and a lot of other uh, people, and the ability to actually turn this into a real revolution that actually democratizes depends on your ability to create now a coalition of people that want uh, democratic accountability. But in the first instance, it does seem to me that what you know the events of the spring in a way demonstrated is that a, there's a universality to the desire to live you know, under a regime that recognizes basic human dignity, uh, and B, that this is driven by modernization, by education, by rising incomes. And one of the big things that's happened all over the world that I think people do not adequately take aboard is there's been this huge middle-class revolution in Brazil, in South Africa, in China, in Thailand, in, you know, many, many different parts of the world. You've had the rise of a middle class, and that's really what's powered, I think, global democracy uh, around the world in the past uh, generation. Thank you. One small footnote. Mohammed Atta was of the upper middle class in Cairo. He got a scholarship to the Technical Hochschule in Hamburg. He then later flew one of the airplanes into the second tower so some middle class people have a tendency to go in an opposite direction. Just a footnote. There was uh, a- Although, by the way, he was radicalized in Europe. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I think there's cultural reasons why middle class, you know, Middle Easterners uh, are more likely to be radicalized. The, the, that Muslim guy that's now on trial for trying to blow up his underwear, same thing. He was radicalized at the LSC, not in Nigeria. True, true. Don't go to Europe. The next point, in your book you have a wonderful quote from a great funny guy who taught for many years at College Park, University of Maryland, and uh, he says something that took you much longer to say in your book. He said it in an article about roving bandits. That's what we used to always have when we were tribal people, roving bandits who stole, or after we settled down, we had stationary bandits who continued to rob us, you and me. And of course, Mancor was uh, thinking about the United States in many instances because, and now you get to your modern times, there is, I'm a Virginian, and we gave you a marvelous person in Mr. Madison. Mr. Madison wrote a wonderful short article also in, uh, it's called, number seven of those famous articles that were then public, no, excuse me, number 10, in which he argued to all of you who wanted the American Constitution back in those days that not to worry because this Constitution is written so that most power would remain at the local level and there would be a weak uh, center. And people still buy that argument today. So it's a very hard country, it seems to me, to govern if we all believe in our souls that basically from Gavin Newsom, uh, ex of San Francisco, to Jerry Brown, to Mr. Obama, that they are all stationary bandits and they're just there to rip us off. So keep government low, keep it powerless. What do you have to say to that? Well, look, <laughs> there's this tradition in the United States that is a component part of American exceptionalism uh, that is very hostile to the government per se. And I think, you know, my former colleague and, and one of the other great mentors, Seymour Martin Lipset, that taught at Stanford for many years, wrote a book, you know, a very famous book on, on American exceptionalism. And, you know, he says this comes out of the, the revolution and the distrust of monarchical authority, and it's very uh, deeply bred uh, in American society. But I think that it fails to take account of the fact that government also plays a uh, moral role. I mean, you cannot understand what the modern state is unless you uh, see that there's a distinction between the public and the private uh, realms, and there's something like a public or common interest, and that 
simply aggregating a lot of private interest doesn't always get you to the public interest. You know, you've got this big collective action problem, which Mansur Olson also wrote about, and that the state, in many respects, is the only organization that is going to be powerful enough to actually protect non-elites uh, from, um, you know, from various oligarchic forces. So in my book, there's many examples of states that actually uh, uh, played that, that kind of role. Uh, and in a sense, the, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's a whole chapter on medieval Hungary. You may ask, you know, why does anyone want to read about medieval Hungary? The reason is that in the same year of the Magna Carta, not the same year, but in the same decade as the Magna Carta, the Hungarian nobility imposed uh, a thing called the, the Golden Bull on their king, Andrew, uh, limiting constitutionally his powers, but limiting it so greatly that when the Turks finally came to invade early in the 16th century, they couldn't raise enough taxes to defend the country and half of it you know, fell uh, to the Ottoman uh, Empire. And so it is also the case that sometimes you need powerful states that have legitimate taxing authority uh, and legitimate meaning the elites have to agree uh, that they will give up a share of their income in order to meet these common uh, goals like, you know, common defense or building infrastructure or whatnot. I uh, personally, this is now my editorial opinion, think we've gotten ourselves into this, you know, very bad situation, especially on the right in this country, that simply does not see legitimacy in having a state or in taxation. And in fact, if you look at my book, you know, what a state is all about is actually taxation, the ability to legitimately tax for public purposes, you know, for uh, for, for purposes of, of common uh, public interest, you can do it more or less efficiently, and of course we all want to do it more uh, efficiently, but you can't get to a modern society uh, you know, without, that, uh, without that particular function. There's water behind you, if you need some water. Okay, then let's take this a step forward. Let's go back to China. We are the Pacific Rim here. In your book, you mention the fact that with the arrival of the Ming dynasty, and this is a dynasty that now has thrown out the foreign dynasty, the Mongols, has moved its capital from Nanjing up to Beijing, Mongol Dadu, and has set up a strong state, a strong Ming state, but the centuries go by. And towards the end of the Ming state, the state has become weak. The state particularly is opposed by certain very strong families living in the lower Yangtze Delta, very wealthy, very influential, very extended in their lineage so that they have cousins and uncles and aunts in all directions, the famous Yangtze Delta families. And they don't want to hear any request from Beijing for more tax monies, to raise more soldiers. At the same time, the Ming, uh, if you all of you know Beijing well, basically China soon ends. It's called the Great Wall, a series of different walls. But the Ming Wall is not that far from Beijing. And on the other sides are not very friendly people. And they're already raiding, and they're incurring, and they are raiding. And so the Ming are into trouble. But since the polity will not go along, since the extended sense of China is no longer responding to that central power, the Ming are overthrown. The last Ming emperor runs up to Cold Hill behind the Forbidden City, hangs himself, and that's the end of that. Then there's a civil war that follows because not all of the Ming minions below want to accept these so-called Manchu outsiders. So it is possible, you hint in your book, that while states can rise, great and powerful countries can, in fact, make a tremendous imprint, states can also decay and fall. So when I read that, I thought about all my friends in gated communities in Palm Springs. <laughs> so do you think that has any reference at all to some Amer or Were you thinking that when you wrote? Or what were you doing? <laughs> well, so hopefully I was not thinking about Palm Springs and then trying to research the Ming Dynasty to figure out how to discredit these people in Palm Springs. Uh, it, it should work the other way around. Uh, however, I do believe that just because you're a liberal democracy and a successful one at one point in your history does not mean that you're going to continue to be a successful uh, polity uh, uh, for all times. And the same process of what I call repatrimonialization happens to every single society on Earth. That is to say, 
the rich and the powerful, in particularly in periods of extended peace and prosperity, tend to get more, more powerful and, and, and richer uh, because they can pass on a lot of their, uh, you know, their advantages to their children. They can use their existing political power to protect their own privileges. And if you look at um, the American tax code at the moment, you know, that's basically what this is all about. This is basically about powerful interest groups that are so well entrenched, nobody can get rid of them, and they use that power, their ability to capture a particular subcommittee uh, to, you know, to basically defend their interests. And one of the big reasons we got a big budget deficit is that you've got all of these veto players that are representative of powerful interest groups in the society that are strong enough to block anyone from hurting their interests, but collectively are not enough to actually come to a decision about how to close the budget or to deal with some of these, you know, this extremely serious fiscal problem that we've got uh, lying over their heads. And of course, you know, part of the deal is not also wanting to pay uh, taxes because that's, you know, that's um, uh, one of the, you know, the sources of their own wealth uh, and power. Uh, I think the other issue that strikes me today is just ideological rigidity because there are also many cases where you create an institution or you create a, a set of ideas that are important and workable uh, for one period of time, but then people begin worshiping their own institutions and circumstances change and they're not just, they're not functional anymore. And I sort of think that's what's happened with a lot of Reaganism because when Reaganism came, you know, came in in the 1980s, you actually did have a big overgrown welfare state. You, you could get a lot of low-hanging fruit by doing some deregulation and pruning back of the government, but in a certain sense, that's become a form of religion you know, for uh, people that is believed, you know, regardless of whether it's actually a workable um, and, and empirically testable uh, hypothesis. And you know, the left has its own uh, hang-ups, uh, uh, I think at the moment, you know, they're probably a little bit less uh, uh, in, in entrenched, but I think that a combination of this patrimonialization of the political system and then excessive institutional rigidity, you know, could spell uh, uh, very big problems for this country uh, um, uh, in, in really not that, that long a period of time. You raised it. I was waiting. Here it goes. President Reagan. When I first started reading you, people told me you were a neocon. What is a neocon? <laughs> well, th there's, I wrote a whole book on this, uh, America at the Crossroads, um, because at the time of the Iraq War, there were basically a lot of misconceptions uh, about who neoconservatives were. So the original generation, uh, people like Irving Kristol and Irving Howe and Daniel Bell, Nathan Glazer had actually started out as people on the extreme left. A lot of them were Trotskyites when they were students at City College in New York, uh, who moved to the right on a number of issues, uh, including whether American power could be used for moral purposes, uh, and uh, on uh, the question of whether um, you ought to be skeptical about you know uh, uh, large-scale ambitious. Uh, social engineering, and but they retain many of the characteristics of the um, of the of the left, including the universalism. And so there was a belief that democracy was not just something that was right for white Americans and you know Anglo-Saxon Protestants, but it was a universal value. That the United States had a role in you know promoting this around the world. I think they actually went off the tracks for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, in the late 1990s, because in a sense the power became a kind of end uh, uh, in itself, and that was where I got off that particular uh, bandwagon. But it's not a it's not an alien spore that came in from Mars and just implanted itself in this virgin American.